Peter. So super. Well, this is wonderful to have another opportunity to have a chat. And I just love the title you suggested for this conversation. Um, and if I remember correctly, it was uh, regeneration as the essence of life's self-organization. That's that right. That's right. And I'm I'm very curious uh, uh, what will come out of our conversation because uh, you have used the term regeneration for a long time. You are sort of way ahead of the curve. It's very popular now. But when you published your book, uh, Designing Regenerative Cultures, that was what, almost 10 years ago? Or... Um, it was 2016, so not quite 10 years. Uh, Eight years yeah. ago, yeah. Still, still very early on. And so uh, I think what what I can contribute is really the important insight from the forefront of science that uh, regeneration is the essential process of life. When you look at, uh, uh, just look at a single cell, to take the simplest example of a living organism, uh, then you observe that the cell is a network of processes, right? Technically known as autopoiesis. And it, uh, when you ask what, what do these processes do? What's it all about? And it's all about the cell regenerating itself, regenerating, replacing, renewing uh, every component uh, the cellular network does that itself. So it is self-organizing and uh, that's essential. the essential activity of life. If you want to be more philosophical, you can also say that's the meaning of life or it's the purpose of life. Uh, but uh, what, whatever terms you use, uh, you realize that when regeneration stops, life stops. So it's it's really the, the very essence of life. And I think that's a really important insight. Because you, you get it at the level of organs as well, um, where the, the cells within a given organ also replace themselves over um, exactly. the time. Our brain cells, we always thought that they they are the same and just get less, but now cutting edge neuroscience shows that they also replace themselves. Right. We we're not really the same person that we were six years ago. Um, we've regenerated ourselves multiple times since then. Yeah, yeah, well, yes and no. We are not really the same person, but in another sense, we are, because the identity does not depend on the actual material structures which are renewed and regenerated all the time. The identity really is the pattern of relationships that that defines a living being. And so it's it's the relationships within ourselves and the relationships to our environment. I mean, when when you ask me, if you had asked me at the beginning to introduce myself, right, I would have said, I could have said, you know, I'm a scientist and an author. I could have said I'm a philosopher, but I could have also said I'm a father or I'm a tennis player or I'm a jazz fan. And all of that describes me. And it's all a description in terms of relationships to other living beings, relationships to the environment, and also, of course, historical relationships and genetic relationships <clears throat> to our ancestry. So, so that really is what, what the identity of, of a living being is. I mean, that, that to some extent, um, also relates to <clears throat> Maturana and Varela's um, Santiago theory of cognition. That in the, act, in the act of distinction in which we define a self in relation to an environment, as they say, we bring forth a world. And it's it, it's that act of distinction that then creates these multiple narratives in which we find our identity. 
Yes, and this was also a central message of Gregory Bateson, who, who did not formulate it in terms of a coherent theory like Maturana and Varela did, but who emphasized very much that uh, the language of nature is a, a language of relationships. And and that uh, you know understanding life means understanding relationships. I mean, to some extent, we both have fond memories of um, somebody that that I really regard one of, as one of my great mentors, Professor Brian Goodwin, um, who started the Masters in right. Science at Schumacher College, and um, it is this moving away from the mechanistic Newtonian science that describes what Nora Bates now would call cold data of an objective world. So it's knowledge about objects and their relationships, but the complexity worldview not only recognizes that we are emergent properties of this dynamic process, but it also, because they're complex dynamic systems, they're fundamentally unpredictable and uncontrollable invites us into a new way of relating that Brian called the, the shift from prediction and control in science, the aim of prediction and control, to appropriate participation. And, and again, for me, that is so linked to the, the notion of what a regenerative culture would like look, look like. How would we as human beings, individuals and collective, re-fit into this complex, dynamic, evolving whole that we fundamentally depend upon because that's what brought us forth. Right. And I, I remember speaking of Brian Goodwin, who really influenced my thinking very much because he was at Schumacher College uh, throughout the 1990s when I taught my courses there. And <clears throat> he came to every one of my classes. And uh, so... Uh, he was just sitting in, uh, in in my courses, and we always had very exciting dialogues in, in the classroom. And I remember one thing he said, which I don't think he published anywhere, but it has stayed with me during all these years. And uh, I don't know whether you uh, uh, remember this as one of his uh, assertions. He said, <clears throat> complex systems are intelligible, but not predictable. And, and that is a really very subtle distinction that in order to understand something, you, you don't need the power of prediction. Or you could say they're not predictable in the classical sense uh, <clears throat> of a system uh, behaving in a certain way at a certain time but they are predictable qualitatively. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and in, you know, when, when I teach, I often use the example of, of, of our pets that, uh, you know, we have two cats here and uh, you can never predict exactly what the cat will do at a certain time, but you always know that it will not behave like a dog. Mm -hmm. It will not jump up at, uh, at you and and uh, trying to persuade you to go for a walk because that's not what cats do. That's what dogs do. So you can make a qualitative prediction, and uh, you know technically uh, you can uh, determine the attractor that represents the dynamics of a complex system, but you can never predict where in the attractor uh, the state of the system will be at a certain time. But Daniel, I want to come back to uh, regeneration and, and make another comment. We talked about the level of the cell and the level of multicellular organisms. And I want to go to the ecological level to uh, remind us that the regeneration of life in nature is ancient knowledge. This is not something new because we know that with the turn of the seasons, there's new growth in every spring. And so all, all the plants and also the parts of animals regenerate themselves 
you know, in the cycle, during the cycle of the seasons. So, so what is new in, in uh, the sy systemic understanding of life is that this regeneration works at all levels down to the molecular networks in cells. But regeneration itself is ancient human knowledge. Absolutely. But also just sticking with the ecosystems for a bit, the, the, all the work of Bas Holling and um, Gunderson on, and, and the Resilience <clears throat> Alliance, this, this notion of panarchy and the adaptive cycle. In, in many ways, the adaptive cycle that ecosystems go through have the, the regeneration part and the creative destruction part, the release of rigidity after a long growth phase in order to yes. allow for this self-organizing regenerative process to happen and it is scale linked it happens in the locality in the region and globally and these scales are moving at different time frames right. feedback right. on each other and it's it, that's another i think a very related um explanation within ecological system science yes. and, 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 and of course of course uh, you know regeneration and creativity are very much related because what you have in a living system is a network of processes and uh, embodied in that network are feedback cycles. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, there are two kinds of feedback. There's the, the self-balancing feedback and there's the self-amplifying feedback. So most of the time a living organism will balance itself and will stay in a, in a state of homeostasis, in a dynamic equilibrium. And so when it regenerates itself, it will renew itself to more or less the state it, it was before. But there's also the self-amplifying feedback, which leads to, a, which may lead to a state of instability and the breakthrough to a new state of order and and this is the process of emergence that is also very much discussed these days. And it um, reflects the creativity of life. So regeneration is not, not always, you know, regenerating the status quo, but it can also be creating a new a new state of order, new new uh, state of, of the system. Absolutely, and this that actually relates to one of the the kind of slight little bones that I pick with some of the the people who who from Regenesis Group and Carol Sanford who hold a lot of the the regenerative mm -hmm. development practice that they've developed over 25, 30 years. But where I don't see eye to eye with them is that um, their perception of health is a um, pathogenic perception of health, where health is a perfect state of well, well health, yeah? Yeah. Uh, well, and then you fall out of that state and you bounce back you bounce back into it you you brought back it just like you were just describing one form of regeneration into the almost previous yeah. state. but there's also always a dimension of learning and particularly in the in Aaron Antonovsky's salutogenic understanding of health he said that health is a dynamic process of learning where every illness that every um, stressor that we are thrown at makes the body learn. And mm. makes, so, so our, our health is slightly different. Sometimes it's decreased because we had a strong illness that uh, really challenged our immune system, but many times it actually leaves our immune system stronger. And in, in that distinction is precisely that, that part of regeneration <clears throat> where regeneration creates transformation new states of being um the exploration of novelty that that, that that whitehead spoke about yeah and that is a very good example health is a very good example because we all have the experience of of being well or being sick health and illness and uh it is well known that people who go through a severe illness and come out of it will feel healthier than they were before because they have made changes in their lives so changes in in you know their their physical organism that are beneficial and that lead to you know a new state of being and a new state of well-being so again as as you said 
the the uh, imbalance, which is uh, an illness, can be uh, healed by going back to a previous state of health or breaking through and uh, trans through a transformation and the emergence of a new state of health. And, and, and another conceptual um, and, and very popular framework at the moment that th this relates to is the whole notion of resilience. That again, people often misunderstand resilience right. by only thinking of it in its first mm -hmm. two dimensions, which is the capacity of persistent the persistence in in the face of disruption, and the the adaptive capacity, the capacity yeah. to bounce back in the face of the uh, disruption. But the, the the third dimension of resilience is precisely again this transformative resilience, where in in complex dynamics systems terms, the system actually learns enough that it changes the attractor, it 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 jumps into new system state, um, and and that, that that's often again, in the regenerative world, misunderstood when people often dismiss resilience thinking as something that, again, is a maintain level works going back to the original state. Yeah. But resilience can also have a, a learning, yeah. transformative, regenerative dimension. Well, you know, I'm, I'm all for being precise and defining your terms and distinguishing between certain terms but you know, lately I've come more and more to the view that once you understand, uh, you know, what life is all about, once you understand the essential nature of life from a systems point of view, you see that there is this network, there are networks within networks, that they are networks of processes, that the processes are regenerative, that they also imply creativity, that the whole network is intelligent. We haven't spoken about that yet. Once you realize that, you realize that all these terms are different ways of saying the same thing. Whether you talk about regeneration or sustainability or uh, resilience or you know ecological processes, it's it's all different ways of de describing the same situation, and it's very exciting to me that that you know when you have when you realize that the living world is profoundly non-linear and profoundly complex. This means that if you have this vast non-linear network, you can start from any part, and you can start with different terminologies, but you will end up with the same insight about the, the very nature of the network. This, yeah, th th I actually put that in my notes for, for this call because this, and now I know why, because you've just led me to it. Um, Ilya Prigozhin's sentence that, that is so pertinent to where we're at right now with regard to the shift from a degenerative cultural pattern to a re return to a regenerative cultural pattern as you were yeah. saying we we've been regenerative before it's it's in in our very nature as human beings along 290,000 years of our species journey to be regenerative expressions of place to be custodians of the bioregions that we emerged from but in this modern framing Ilya Prigozhin said um when a complex system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence in a sea of chaos have the capacity to shift the entire system to a higher order. Yes. I would love you to reflect on, 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 on that. What, what, what do you think he's saying and how is that significant with regard to the culture change where and, and, and kind of shift towards a sustainable, regenerative human presence on Earth that we're now having to make? Well, there's there's uh, a lot we can say about Prigozhin, who was one of the major architects of what I now call the systems view of life, uh, elucidating uh, the uh, the flows of energy and matter through a living organism, the uh, the whole phenomenon of emergence of bifurcations, of instabilities, 
and so on. And uh, one of the big achievements of Prigozhin was that he solved a paradox that had existed sin in science since the 19th century. And the paradox is the following. The 19th century, uh, you could say, was the century of evolutionary thought. In many fields, people thought about evolution in geology, in astronomy, and of course, in, in biology with, with Darwin. But in physics, also people thought about evolution in the uh, development of thermodynamics. And when you look at the two uh, views of evolution by physicists and biologists in the 19th century, then you see that they are uh, diametrically opposed. The physicists would say uh, that the universe goes from order to disorder. And they created the, uh, the, the concept of entropy to measure the disorder. So entropy increases in, in systems until the whole universe comes to a halt. They call it a heat death. Uh, heat death. Everything stops. The biologists led by Darwin said exactly the opposite. They said living organisms go from disorder to order. And that's the whole story of evolution, the continuous emergence of new forms of order, ever more complex, ever more sophisticated. So who was right? You know, uh, the, the thermodynamicists or the evolutionary biologists? And Prigozhin realized that when a living organism creates this order, when we Let's just take a concrete example. When we eat a vegetable, we take in an ordered system and break it down. And so we increase the disorder of the system and we use the, the components to maintain or even increase our own order. And then we discard the remaining disorder as the waste products. And so Prigozhin realized that every increase of order in life happens within a larger environment of a decree, an increase of disorder. So the, the famous second law of thermodynamics, which says that the disorder increases in the universe is correct overall, but within that sea of disorder, or sea of chaos, as you just quoted Prigozhin, within that sea of disorder, there are islands of order. And the order may well increase continually on these islands. And uh, then the other part of the, this quotation means that within the increase of order, this doesn't need to be a steady uh, process but it can have jumps, it can have breakthroughs uh, with emergence of new states of order from uh, an instability through what is called a bifurcation. Mm -hmm. yes, I mean, I, I thought of this a lot because you, you very often bump into the physicist's argument of, well, that goes straight against the second law of thermodynamics. And... Um, Another dimension to my mind is that the, the timescales of physics are just so much vaster than the timescales of biology and ecology. And the localized evolution of life on one planet in one galaxy of this vast expanding cosmos um, for a few billion years in that localized place Life is the syntrophic force that, that actually creates more and more stored syntrophic energy in a living planet. Ultimately, the biosphere becomes that Gaian living system. Um, and that doesn't mean that that runs against the second law of thermodynamics because um, there's probably also temporal fluctuations where in certain areas of the, the universe, Syntropy increases order, 
while in other... Well, but also, Daniel, we, we need to remember that the second law of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics holds for closed systems, mm -hmm. and living systems are very importantly open systems. Living systems are, uh, require a constant flow of energy and matter through them to stay alive. That's why they're called open systems in terms of energy and materials. So we know we need to breathe, we need to drink, we need to eat uh, every, every day to stay alive. And so that's a very situ different situation from the situation the physicists describe. And to show you how you can approach this knowledge of the living world from different sides and come to the same point. Let me just remind you that this constant flow of energy and matter is needed for regeneration. Because if there were no energy and matter entering into a living organism, it could not replace its parts. It wouldn't have the raw materials to, to uh, replace its parts. So again, this, this very important uh, phenomenon of metabolism, the constant flow of energy and matter through a living organism, through this network of processes, is very essentially linked to uh, the, the essence of, of life, which is regeneration. I wanted to also be like well, earlier we talked about Brian Goodwin and um, another piece of work that Brian Goodwin was very critically involved in, in, in starting a conversation on was this shift towards what he called the science of qualities and um, this yeah. this precisely because his view on complexity really foregrounded the uncertainty that that complex dynamic systems bring to our world and um, that, that we we cannot we we can the, the the difference the nuance that you you pointed out the difference between being able to make to, to understand make intelligible complex dy dynamic systems dynamics but not to be able to fundamentally predict them over more than very short time spans in in bounded um, conditions, and mm. so th that led Brian to to say we need more than just the cold analytical rationalism of the kind of positivist science, and we need to find new ways of letting um, informed intuition and qualitative relationships inform science. Mm. Can you recall some of your conversations with him about... about yes, yes, absolutely. And I, I think, uh, well, first of all, let me say that Brian was a very special person because he was a mathematician mm -hmm. and he was an evolutionary biologist. And he also was a very spiritual person. And he had a... A, a strong interest in the history of science and especially in the romantic movement in the uh, 18th and 19th century, uh, you know, around 1800, the time of, of Goethe and the German romantics. And I think Brian was actually, I mean, I know Brian was actually influenced very much by Goethean science. And I think what you just mentioned, his his emphasis on a different kind of intuition. Uh, you will remember that, that uh, Goethe talked about Anschauung, which is a, a German word for a special kind of intuition. Uh, and, and again, you know, coming back to Bateson, Bateson had that too. Bateson had a very strong intuitive approach to understanding nature. And when he looked at the plant or at a seashell or any any part of life, he he had an intuitive approach of uh, what its very essence was. Bateson uh, was not a mathematician. He he disliked mathematics. He disliked physics. 
and so he uh, he was had more had more of a philosophical intuitive approach. Uh, but you know, Brian covered all these bases, and uh, you know, I I had uh, long discussions with him in my classes about the German Romantic movement and uh, their contributions to philosophy, to uh, an an early precursor of evolution when they talked about archetypes of forms. They realized that uh, the skeletons of animals showed great similarities. You can compare, you know, a bird and and a, a deer and or a horse and identify corresponding uh, bones in, in their skeleton. And they, they talked about archetypes, so urtypen in German, and uh, this influenced the early work of Charles Darwin in evolution. So they were forerunners of, of evolutionary thinking. I mean, the, the Brian's work was very much linked, to, like this link from Goethe's metamorphosis of form and then the, the metamorphosis of Pflanzen and auch the, the, the Tiere. Um, but then you get um, um, Darcy, Darcy Thompson um, with his um, on growth and form, this dynamic understanding of how natural form evolved. And I, I believe Waddington, who Brian did his PhD with, was a strong student of Darcy Thompson. So this 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 interest in dynamic form and applying complexity. Yeah, well, there's a whole lineage, and and uh, <clears throat> you know the the forerunner of this lineage. Uh, whom uh, almost nobody knows in, in that sense. He's one of the best known intellectuals, but nobody knows that he was the forerunner of the science that Goethe called morphology, the study of form. The forerunner was Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo, Leonardo in his science studied the living forms of nature and studied their transformations and and their shapes and this is what he drew and painted and and wrote about i spent 10 years reading leonardo's famous notebooks and i discovered that essentially leonardo's science was a science of life and it's one of the great uh, tragedies in the history of science that his writings were hidden for centuries after his death. So Goethe, who had a lot of common with Leonardo, uh, wrote an essay about the Last Supper, but he never saw Leonardo's scientific works and he would have very much related to them because you know they, they had the same kind of qualitative thinking. Leonardo's science as Goethe's was a science of qualities. The, the, the other dimension that comes in here is um, that Goethe can also be understood as the first phenomenologist. That, um, I mean, he said at some point that, 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 that in his Zarte, uh, speak, uh, spoke, speaking about his Zarte Empirie, his tender empiricism, that if you pay attention to how the phenomena arises in your own awareness, then the, ins the, 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 the specific incidents can be the perfect theory, he, he said. Mm -hmm. And what, what I think he was trying to get there is, uh, there was, is that he, at a time when people like Newton were very much going into um, the descriptive science of something out there, he was keenly aware that his own way of observing, his own way of cognitively participating in the phenomenon actually had a massive influence on what, how he was observing and what he was observing. And in many ways, that's pre-shadowing like um, uh, Erwin Schrödinger, what we observe. Uh, oh, Heisenberg, yes. Heisenberg um, what we observe is not nature, but nature exposed to our methods of questioning. Um, right. 
Well, the the situation with these forerunners, both, uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, who was, you know, 300 years earlier, and, and also Goethe, was that they realized that uh, the living world is highly nonlinear, as you as we would say today. They didn't use these terms, but they both realized that. And uh, the mathematics of their time, which was the mathematics of Newton for Goethe, the calculus of Newton, and Euclidean geometry for Leonardo, uh, both of these types of mathematics are not uh, appropriate to describe nonlinear systems. And so they struggled to find a language. And, and uh, you know, the, uh, Leonardo used his synthesis of art and science, which in a sense is also Goethe's synthesis. There are a lot of interesting parallels between the two. But they uh, they had a hard time formulating a proper theory of living forms, you know, lacking the uh, mathematics to deal with nonlinear systems. That came with Henri Poincaré and the three body problem in yeah. the early 1900s, and then with right. with the fractal geometry um, of Mandelbrot and 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 so right. on. Right, and then the whole the whole complexity theory and nonlinear equations with computers and so on. Uh, but, and, but it's, uh, it's, I think we need to be careful to not give the impression that we have a mathematical theory of life. Although, you know, there are mathematical methods that, that can be used, and Brian Goodwin used many of them to build mathematical models. But what we have is a mathematics of nonlinear phenomena, <clears throat> which brought to light a number of new concepts, such, such as the concept of uh, emergence and, and nature's inherent creativity, and the concept of regeneration, and the concept of the intelligence of life. None of this would have happened without the nonlinear mathematics, but it doesn't mean that we have a full-blown mathematical theory of, of life, and we may never have that, but we have certain important insights. It relates to what you said at the beginning with regard to that really what we live in and what complexity theory now helps us to describe and nonlinear mathematics helps us to approximate um, is that we live in a relational world that everything is brought for through sets of relationships at different scales and that the cold data of statistic that that is statistically analyzable data sets is only one aspect of slicing into this and and um, um, Gregory Bateson's daughter Nora I don't know have you have you had an opportunity to talk with Nora Bateson about her notion not of form and form data not not recently no she, you she, know I'm I'm over 80 now and I have to limit my uh, research projects and contacts and so on so I teach my online course on the systems view of life and I give various seminars and lectures, but I don't reach out too far. You know, I'm. I'm I completely understand. Um, so I think you would you would in, in, enjoy it um, because Nora has coined this term, which she calls warm data, and um, she uh -huh. explains it as the transcontextual data that we all have, and that makes the bridge to Brian Goodwin's science of quality and also Goethe's kind of. Um, tender empiricism is that we have different access to understanding that intelligibility of the complex dynamic systems we participate in that Brian spoke about is not entirely through only the thinking way of knowing, but also allows for sensing, intuiting, and feeling. The In, in, in what Stefan Harding unearthing Jung's work on the four dimensions of knowing, um, 
also points at this, that, that what, what this new science of quality really tries to grapple with is what we are all capable of, but it, we sort of yeah. amplified it because of our scientific education. That, that uh, we... It makes total sense. It makes total sense because, I mean, it's also related what 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 I call systems thinking and the whole mm -hmm. systems approach, because systems thinking is thinking about relationships, about patterns, about context. And it, it makes sense because uh, our rational mind is necessarily linear. When we speak, we speak in sentences with one word after the other. And when we write, we write that way. And uh, however, our intuitive mind is, is nonlinear. And so intuition is a perception of nonlinear patterns. And, and this is why, you know, artists can be of great help in, in the system's view of life because they, they use their intuition much more than, than scientists. Although intuition, we must say, has always been part of science, of course, but it's not recognized in science education. And, uh, you know, when it's interesting, I, I remember this from my days as a physicist, that uh, when uh, researchers make a discovery, they may have uh, thought about it in a dream, or they may have an intuition when they walk in the woods, or they... Uh, they have a, a hunch or a gut feeling, and uh, it's often highly intuitive. And then they work it out. And in, in my field of physics, you know, develop the mathematics and formulate a scientific model. And they publish it, you know. And when they publish it, they say, as so and so have shown in their paper, blah, blah, blah we are extending this now to that and that and we use you know certain type of differential equation and we have managed to show that and intuition is completely lost they never talk about <clears throat> it it's not published in the scientific papers and it's not taught in in the universities in science classes but of course it's it's part of science and has always been What's the famous um, physicist who had the dream about the Ouroboros and then understood how the... No, about the benzene ring, yeah. the chemist, actually. I don't remember who it was. Maybe yeah. Han or yeah. somebody. Yeah. Um, I, have, I also I took one more quote of Brian's out that, that I thought would be nice to read to you and, and, and just hear what, what your reflections on it is. It's, it's about what we've already spoken about. Um, a science of emergent qualities involves a break from the positivist tradition that separates facts and values and reestablishes a foundation of a naturalistic ethic. Participation now enters as the fundamental ingredient in the human experience of any phenomena, which arises out of the encounter between two real processes that are distinct but not separable. The human process of becoming regeneration and that of of the other whether this may be uh, the, the, oh, sorry um, i'll skip this and the human process of becoming and that of the other whatever this may be to which the human is attending in this encounter wherein the phenomena is generated feelings intuitions are not arbitrary but idiosyncratic accompaniments of the direct indicators of the nature of the natural process that occurs in the encounter. By paying attention to these, we can ga gain insights into the emergent reality in which we participate. I think that he really po points his finger on, on something there. Yeah, there's a lot in this paragraph, of course, you know, it's a, it's a, I'll send it's it. A, it's a heavy message. It's a heavy message. Yeah. Uh, what it reminds me of is uh, uh, the theory of consciousness by Antonio Damasio, who is one of the leaders in the in the contemporary uh, cognitive science, 
along with Maturana and Varela and uh, you know several others. Uh, and and Damasio has shown in his work that in the emergence of consciousness from uh, neural processes, from brain uh, processes, which is not yet completely understood. This how conscious awareness emerges from neurophysiology is not yet understood. And it is known as the heart problem of consciousness research. But what, what uh, Damasio has shown is that emotions play a critical role. And uh, he distinguishes very interestingly between emotions and feelings. And he says emotions are very old physiological processes that go far back in evolution that are shared by all mammals and even vertebrates and, and other forms of life. And when emotions become conscious, they we call them feelings. So we are conscious of our emotion and we feel something. And, and that shift from emotion to feeling is a shift is related somehow in, in a yet mysterious way to the shift from uh, neural networks and their emergent uh, phenomena to conscious awareness. Can I can I um, lead you in, in onto the thin eyes of conjecture here? Because again, in conversations with Brian, I know that he really didn't like the idea that consciousness was somehow this emergent ex nihilo at some point in a chain of ever more complex beings with more complex neural networks with, with, with more complex new, uh, um, neural systems. Um, he said that it makes actually much more sense or at least equal sense in, in a logical way to um, assume that consciousness is there from the start, that they're just at different degrees. And in a similar way, I think he also understood that life doesn't emerge ex nihilo, but is somehow like, it's all alive, it's all conscious, it's all intelligent, um, but just at different degrees. Is, is, is that um, pop science or can, can you- no, 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 not at all. This is something very old, very ancient. It's a view that is held by many spiritual traditions around the world, a view that I'm very familiar with. And it's not the view I'm presenting in my work and I'm, I'm uh, you know, researching. It's not what I call the systems view of life. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, uh, I'm uh, a little allergic to your uh, use of ex nihilo yeah. because uh, uh, in, in the systems view, uh, mind or cognition uh, emerges at the same time as life emerges, but it doesn't emerge from a vacuum. No, mm -hmm. it, it emerges from a material universe mm -hmm. and uh, it may well be embedded in that material universe from the beginning, but there is a certain process of evolution where you have, according to current theories, you have the Big Bang, you have the creation of uh, a number of uh, bundles of energy, which are what we call elementary particles. Uh, they, the space uh, that begins at the same time, space and time expand. Uh, the, the, the hot gases of particles cool down. They form atoms, they form molecules, they form galaxies and so on. And so you have matter which is uh, present in patterns of order. Again, I remember Gregory Bateson saying, uh, I don't know of any matter that is not ordered. Order is a very, very key phenomenon from the very beginning. And so these bundles of energy uh, 
you could say, are also patterns of organization. You could say an, an atom represents a certain kind of organization involving protons and neutrons and electrons. And a molecule is, uh, again, at another level, a pattern of organization. And so as matter becomes more and more complex and molecules become larger, there is a point where networks form that are self-organizing. And at that point, we have the emergence of life. And again, we don't quite know how it happened. There's a whole branch of science about the origin of life. And when life emerges in evolution, cognition emerges at the same time. And the relationship between mind and matter, according to these theories of Maturana and Varela and others, the relationship is uh, one between process and structure. So uh, cognition is a process and uh, matter Living matter is the structure, the network structure in which this process is embedded. And so as the now we are in biological evolution, first we were in sort of cosmic, you know, astronomic uh, evolution <laughs> now we are, or and molecular evolution. Now we are in biological evolution. And as organisms become more and more complex biologically from single cells to multicellular organisms and then to the emergence of plants, animals, fungi, and so on, higher organisms. As they become more and more complex, their uh, cognitive processes become more and more complex. They always go in hand in hand, biological structure and cognitive process. And at a certain level, the organisms are so complex that they develop uh, coordinating organs to, to guide that process of, of interaction. And those are the nervous systems and the brains. And as the nervous systems and brains become more and more complex, somehow, and again, this is mysterious, uh, self-consciousness, conscious awareness emerges. So, so that's the system's view, but it, it doesn't say that consciousness emerges out of nothing. You know, there's a whole history of, uh, you know, material uh, evolution. And as I said, uh, when you come to, to the, uh, the very beginning of it, there are many indications that life is already embedded in the very beginning because if, say, water did not have certain properties, certain relationships between the hydrogen and oxygen atoms within water, if that didn't happen, uh, life would have never emerged. Mm -hmm. And so was it already, was the universe already pregnant with life from its beginning or not? You know, we are coming close to a spiritual view without saying, well, first there's consciousness and there, there was nothing else and then everything else comes from consciousness. Have you, I mean, this might be another one that you just haven't um, had the time to take a journey into, but um, I think his name is Jackson Pollock. Um, physicist. the painter. No? The, the, the painter. Jackson no, Pollock is the painter. No, okay, then, no, I mean, Pollock, his name is Pollock, but not Jackson Pollock. I can't remember the first name okay. the then. Um, the whole notion of the fourth state of water, ex exclusion, easy water, or exclusion zone water, where... Um, no, I've never heard that. It's 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 cutting edge at the moment in, in, in a lot of um, cellular... Uh, biology because it seems to be how a lot of the self-organization is possible and how these the, 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 the life does its kind of syntrophic magic through well, the... I know I know that water is much more complex than we have thought. Mm -hmm. I remember that uh, meeting a group of physicists in Italy at the University of Siena, who investigated these more complex properties of water, who were also very influenced by Prigogine. 
and uh, I have heard things mentioned here and there about uh, you know research into mysterious properties of water, but I, I haven't followed any of that. Um, I'll just find it curious briefly. Um... So I think Daniel will have to stop before yeah. you throw many things at me. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. I just want to just as a as a little you might might find this actually really interesting to read. This is this is the the guy that I was talking about. His name is okay. um, his name is where uh, where well, we have it here. Gerald H. Pollock. Dr. Gerald okay, H. Pollock. Okay, I will look, I will look um, into it. Wonderful. So this has been really, really lovely. Um, I, I, I'll refrain from having, I had one more question, but um, well, well, oh, well can, I, can I ask one more question? question? Okay. Um, because it also, we're talking a lot about science of quality. I, I wanted to highlight a piece of work that you've done that maybe a lot of people don't know. And um, I think it's, it's actually really important, particularly in this conversation that we now have about regenerative economics and um, a new rethinking of our economic system. And that's the work that you did with the late um, Hazel Henderson. Um, yes, on... qualitative growth. Exactly. Uh, because because as biologists, you and I don't like the idea that growth is now the evil of everything. Um, it, 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 economic growth measured in GDP is the evil of everything. But right. Uh, can, can, can we go there just briefly? Yes. Well, as you, well, first of all, when you have a systems perspective and look at the major problems of our time, you realize that they're all interconnected, whether we talk about energy, the environment, uh, the COVID pandemic, economic inequality, uh, the climate catastrophe, they're all interconnected and interdependent. They are systemic problems which need a systemic approach to be understood and solved. And when you have a systemic under, uh, approach, you will see very soon that underlying these problems is the obsession of our economists and politicians with unlimited quantitative growth, with the illusion that unlimited quantitative growth is possible on a finite planet. It's absolutely insane. And, and yet, you know, they all subscribe to that, or most of them, the overwhelming majority. So then you say, well, let's do away with growth. Or some people talk about negative growth or, or, or degrowth. But then, as you just said, growth is essential to life regeneration is is a form of growth but it's qualitative growth which means not everything can grow all the time and and in an infinite unlimited way so in nature in an ecosystem certain parts of nature grow and others reach maturity decline and disintegrate and liberate their components which become resources for new growth. You can you can call this qualitative growth a regenerative process. And so what we need urgently is to shift from quantitative to qualitative growth. And that's what Hazel and I wrote about in, in our paper. Is there anything that in terms of your understanding of, of living that the systems dynamics that because if you look at populations, there is this inflection point where the system shifts the curve from the exponential curve into the logistics curve, where, where the, the curve becomes S-shaped and levels off. And, right. and that's where the, suddenly the quantitative growth phase is over and a qualitative growth phase starts. Um, yes, well, when, when, you, when you look at these curves, when you look at these curves in detail, you see that they are shaped by feedback. Mm -hmm. So you have multiple feedback loops that self-correct, that allow the system to self-correct itself, to self-correct. And we have these feedback loops, you know, all these global catastrophes, heat waves, <clears throat> droughts, hurricanes, inundations, they're all Gaia's feedback loops. Mm -hmm. And so, you would think that 
we are smart enough to recognize them and shift to qualitative growth. And let's just hope that we will do it in time, but it's really urgently needed. Absolutely, yeah, that's a, that's a good place to, to, to end. Thank you so much. That that was a wonderful tour de force. It's a great and... pleasure to to catch up with you, Daniel. And let's do it again after a while when you have when we all have some new thoughts. And it's always very exciting. I'll put in the in the notes underneath this recording. I'll, I'll send it to you when it's um, when it's live. Um, also, the link to the Capra course for those who um, have not done the Capra course yet, they must do it okay. because it's just okay. such a good. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.